Well, let us turn back to the chapter that we read a few minutes ago as we continue in our studies in Ezekiel. And we're at chapter 18 uh, this morning. And most of the times we've been just looking at a chapter uh, at a time, and that is the case uh, today. The title for the message is um, obvious. It is the soul that sins, it shall die. And that's obviously taken from the text itself. It's an interesting chapter. And again, it shows the deceptive heart of man that will seek any excuse or any way out of personal responsibility from sin. We've broken the chapter down into six parts. We're going to look at the proverb in verses 1 to 3, the principle in verse 4, what I'm calling the three-generational lesson in verses 5 to 18, the protest in verses 19 and 20, repentance and apostasy in verses 21 to 29, and the pronouncement in verses 30 to 32. As Patrick Fairbairn, and I've only one quote this morning, as he overviews the chapter, he says, this chapter preserves throughout the form of a controversial pleading, because the people are contemplated by the prophet as in a self-righteous condition, disposed to shift off themselves the blame of what was evil in their lot, and lay it partly on their fathers and partly on God himself. End quote. A bit like the Garden of Eden, where Adam passes the book to Eve, and Eve passes the book uh, to the serpent. This is very much the idea in this chapter, except the, the book is passed to the fathers and also on God. So let us first of all look at the proverb in verses 1 to 3. And the proverb goes as verse 2 says, that what mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, the fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. In other words, it's all our fathers' fault. It's what they have done, blaming their fathers rather than themselves for the consequence and consequences of their sin. As it says in Lamentations 5, 7, our fathers have sinned and are not, and we have borne their iniquities. This proverb is also referred to in Jeremiah 31, verses 29 and 30. In those days they shall no more say, the fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. This saying became a crutch. It became an excuse. It became a defense. It became a, a moral uh, diversion or diverting from the, the moral uh, consequences of their own sin. And God's word here breaks the crutch, destroys the false excuse, destroys the, the, uh, the lie that really this is. Evasion by way of a proverb. Things haven't changed. As we say often as we're going through Ezekiel, things have not changed. People will use any argument to get from under the reality of their own responsibilities. Put the blame on anything or anyone else. Divert attention from themselves. It's one of the big differences. In fact, I would say it's the fundamental difference between the believer and the unbeliever. The unbeliever will incessantly and repeatedly 
justify himself. The believer, in contrast, will confess openly that he is or she is worthy of God's judgment. To use the words of the Apostle Paul, let God be true. Let God be true. The believer says, let God be true. God is right. God is justified in his judgment. What we see in this chapter is rather than justifying God, they justify themselves. And the opposite is the case. They they say God is wrong. Which shows us that we only have two options, don't we? There's no middle ground here. Either God is at fault or somebody else is at fault or we're at fault. There can be no gray area. It is one or the other. As we come to God's house this morning, as we come to this place of worship, where do we stand on this? Where do you stand with regard to responsibility? Sometimes even as believers, we can fall into the trap of maybe questioning God in the wrong sense. We said during the week that there's, there's nothing wrong with the question why. In fact, we are, we are exhorted to ask why. But in that question, we're not to give the implication that God is at fault. We see here the principle, secondly, in verse 4. And we see a threefold principle, in fact, in this one verse. First of all, the ownership of God. It says, behold, all souls are mine. And again, this possession, this ownership of God necessitates the right dealing. In other words, if you own something, it's normal that you will look after the thing unless maybe some children don't learn that principle uh, too early. You know, but... It's normal, and as we grow older, we realize that if I, if I own something, I, I need to use it rightly. And here God is laying down this principle that all souls are mine, and therefore not only does he have the sovereign right over all souls, but that he is a righteous owner of all souls. We see also the distinct and separate relationship of the soul to God as the soul of the father so also the soul of the son is mine in other words there is no second degree separation from our relationship to God we are all belonging to God we cannot hide behind our parents We cannot hide behind anyone else from the youngest to the oldest here today. Our souls belong to God. We are his possession. We belong to him. We cannot avoid that. We cannot evade that reality. People try and live their whole lives with uh, blocking this reality out of their heads. But we, we cannot. We simply cannot. But also the personal responsibility for sin. The soul that sins, it shall die. It is something that we stand between my soul and God. My personal position as owned by God. My personal responsibility for my own sin. This is repeated in verse 20. The soul that sins, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. God could be no clearer. All shadows, all Vain hopes and vain excuses and vain arguments are removed in the face of a God who speaks clearly. The thought came into my mind during the week. 
Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could just sit down with our unsaved family members? We often pray for them on a, on a Tuesday night. We often pray for their salvation. And just to talk him into my head once again, as it often does, just to go down and read the Word of God uh, with them. What a blessing that could be to their souls. But what is the problem? They don't want to hear the Word of God. They don't want its clarity. They don't want the, the God of truth speaking to them. They are content, sadly. Sadly. They are content with the arguments they've built up in their own heads regarding their own goodness and righteousness. And they're not too bad. You know the old story, I'm not too bad. I haven't killed anybody and so on. And all these sort of self-justifying arguments that people sort of build up like a, a little castle in their mind and conscience. I say a castle because it protects them. It protects them from the, the obvious consequences of the fact that if they don't have this castle, they are um, in danger of death and destruction from the righteousness of God. But then in verses 5 to 18, we have this three-generational lesson. I won't read the verses again. We've already read them. But in verses 5 to 9, simply what we have is that doing right and shunning evil will be recognized and acknowledged by the Lord. Remember what the Lord said to Cain. If you do what is right you will be accepted. But if you do not do what is well, sin lies at the door. You see, Cain was filled with his hatred and his animosity and his desire to put to death his brother because his brother exposed his sin and he wanted to destroy anything that would expose his own lack of repentance. And just at that moment, even before the deed is carried out, God's word comes to him as a stark reminder, as a warning from heaven. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? The voice of God comes straight from glory into the very conscience of Cain. And yet even in this moment in this context Cain still goes ahead with his crime, his sin you see it's not that God isn't clear God is clear as Spurgeon famously once said his difficulty with the scriptures is not what was unclear but what was clear that's what we struggle with it's not the genealogies and the, the dates and the, you know, maybe even sometimes the apparent inconsistencies or contradictions. That's not what we struggle with. What we struggle with is the simplicity, the stark clarity of the Word of God when it comes to spiritual and moral issues. As I travel down in the car, this morning I was questioning my own heart even as I tried to sing some verses of a psalm. How much, how much do I really want to sing the praises of God? Am I just going to come to church this morning and lead a worship service formally and this is my duty? Or is my heart filled with his praise? And I had to confess that my heart was not as tuned to his praise as it should be. We don't come here this morning because we have attained a level. We're up here and we are the, the really holy people. We are the, the really good people. We are the obedient people. Now in the face of a a chapter that speaks of wickedness and righteousness, we are confronted 
with the reality that we are not righteous. We are not holy. We do not do as God says. Of course, this man that has described the descriptions of this just man, which ultimately, as we often say in the context of Psalm 1, can only ultimately be fulfilled in the person, life, and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because here in these verses, we have the relationship to God, to women, to money, to power, to those in need, to, to sin, a relationship to judgment between people, and a relationship to the law of God. But it's not just talking about ultimate righteousness. It is talking about practical living. And we must face that. Where do you stand? Not that any one of us will ever live perfectly in relation to this mirror. But where do you stand? What is your relationship to God like? What is your relationship to money like? To those in need? What's your relationship to sin like? Someone has said that in order to have a right relationship to God, we must have a right relationship to sin. We must reject it. We must repent of it. We live in a day when the law of God is being cast aside, even in the church as unnecessary. Yet here, the relationship of to the law of God, is essential to God's approval. We must live in the context of God's law. We must follow his word. We must follow his commands. The Lord Jesus Christ said, if you love me, you will obey what I command. So to whatever degree, by the grace of God and in the fear of God, we have advanced in sanctification in these areas let us praise him let us bless him and let us remember that not only is it possible to displease god it is possible to please him we must live in the light of this truth but then we see the second generation the wicked son in verses 10 to 13 here's a word of consolation to godly parents. It's possible to have children that grow up and are not believers. It's possible to have children that grow up to live sinful lives. That's not comfort for those who are disobedient, but comfort for those who genuinely seek to bring up their children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. There's no absolute guarantee. That's also a warning to the children here, isn't it? That just because you're part of a godly family, you know, that's not sort of an umbrella thing where you're, you know, you have no personal responsibility. No, you are personally responsible to walk with God. From the youngest to the oldest. Yes, Eli had wicked sons in 1 Samuel 2, and he didn't rebuke them. He didn't tell them they were wrong and to, to repent. And he, he facilitated to some degree their sin. And that can cause worry because as, a, as godly parents, we think, well, am I, am I an Eli? <laughs> Is it my fault that my children are like this? But then we are comforted to some degree in the fact that Samuel did not have godly uh, sons but also followed their wickedness. It says in 1 Samuel 8 verse 3, his sons walked not in his ways. Samuel walked in the ways of righteousness. They walked not in his ways. There is a responsibility for children. Children this morning, you are responsible to walk in the ways of your godly parents. Follow them as they follow the Lord. And don't use children, don't use their failings as an excuse for your own sin. Yes, your father and mother will fail. They will 
go wrong at points. That's not an excuse. It's an opportunity for children to pray for their parents, to lift them up in prayer, to pray that God would make them to be more faithful, more loving of Christ, so that you might have a better example to follow in your life. We all need to realize our personal responsibility. We live in a generation where, you know, and again, I know we don't have good governments, especially in Western society. We have pretty bad governments at the moment, to put it mildly. But we're not to be like the world. We're not to be like the world who sit back and mock and laugh and and make fun of, of, of the government. We are to pray for them. Because, you see, when the world does that, it shows that it has the, not only the wrong attitude towards man, but it has the wrong attitude towards God. The world loves to pour ridicule. We are to pour out prayers to the Lord for these. But then the third generation, or the righteous grandson, as I'm calling him in verses 14 to 17. And here's wonderful hope for those that come from wicked parents or parents who don't walk in the ways of God. That it's not a fait accompli that just because you have a mother and father or maybe one who is not following Christ, that does not mean that you will not belong to him. Again, some use this as an excuse. Well, it's the way I was born. It's the way I was brought up. It's my nature and nurture. It's just the way it is. It's an excuse. I was listening to a a sermon on total depravity uh, during the week. And there is a distinction. A distinction was made. It's not that people are unable naturally to come to Christ. Reformed theology makes this distinction. It's not that we deny natural ability. In other words, we can trust things. We can believe things. We can obey things. It's not that natural ability has gone. The ability that is gone is the ability that is gone because we simply don't want to obey. There's something in the nature of man. There's something in our moral and spiritual makeup that will not submit to God. Of course, this was the problem with Israel. And it's the problem still today. The conclusion is in verse 18. Respecting the father or the Second generation, as for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, spoiled by his brother by violence, and did that which is not good among his people, lo, even he shall die in his iniquity. There's also a warning here. Another warning. You know, in this country, or at least in the south of Ireland, there was a sort of a a practice that... And if, if a family maybe had seven or eight children and, you know, there was a doctor, there was a, a solicitor, a policeman or whatever, one of them would be put into the priesthood. And one of the reasons that was done was a sort of a, well, that will bring good on the family. If we have one of the sons as a priest, you know, we're going to get some good back, good kudos before God and before men. Well, here, there's no kudos for the wicked father. It doesn't matter how godly his son is. It doesn't matter how righteous his children are. He needs to get right with God. He needs to repent of his sin. And some people, some professed Christians, will live off the goodness of their children and almost get a get out of jail free card well i'm raising I i can be wicked but i can raise these these can be good in place of me
we never leave the place of being owned by God personally. And that personal responsibility, as one preacher put it well, and again, sometimes when an obvious thing is stated, you say, well, why didn't I think of that first? You know, we talk, we share the gospel with people, and we say, you need to have a personal relationship with God. But the fact is, every single person that has ever existed has from the moment of conception a personal relationship to God. Every one of us, we cannot escape it. The question is this, what type of relationship is it? Is it a relationship of hatred, of enmity, a relationship of love and saving mercy? We must know righteousness ourselves, not just get it from somewhere else. With the obvious exception that the righteousness that we have that makes us acceptable before God is an alien righteousness, is the imputed righteousness of Christ, not the essential righteousness of Christ, but as I often remind you, the, the received or the attained righteousness of Christ in his obedience and death on our behalf. And then we have the protest in verses 19 and 20. Yet, ye say, you see, even at this point, they're not just stopping and listening to God. I pray, even as we're thinking about this now, we'll all be enabled by God's grace just to say, Lord, enable me to stop speaking. And thinking that I have all the answers. And learn by grace to listen to God. To hear his voice. You know, like Samuel said to Saul, Saul, just stand. Stop. And listen to God's voice. Saul was a a man of war, a, a man of action. He was, a, as we said last week, this big man, this imposing character. And the idea of stopping and listening to anybody would have been foreign to him, especially as king. But Samuel says, Saul, there's one you need to stop and listen to. I remember many years ago being overcome with the sense that ones that I love were on their way to to judgment and being lost. And I I wept as a young convert in the car. I wept. And I was asked, why are you crying? And I, I was sort of half embarrassed to say, but in the end I was enabled to say, because I believe you're lost. And if you die in this lost condition, You will be forever lost. The response was, well, shrug of the shoulders. Let me worry about that. What is it in the human heart that even when genuine concern, genuine passion, an outpouring of concern can be met with a shrug of the shoulders? How is it that the heart of man can just ignore Reality. Their protest. Does not the son bear the iniquity of the father? This this is our umbrella of protection. This is the crutch that we, we rest on. The reason why the nation's in a mess and why we're in captivity and we were, in, we were taken by the king of Babylon, it's not my fault. It's not because of my sin. And the younger generation are good at that, aren't they? All the problems is because of what previous generations have done. It's no different today, is it? 
wanting to justify self at the expense of others. But then God dashes their argument. When the Son had done that which is lawful and right, and had kept all my statutes, and had done them, he shall surely live. The Lord brings it straight back to them. Straight back on them. How are you living? Are you doing right? Or are you living under this false umbrella of protection? This false argument, this vain protest? Reinforcement of the principle of personal accountability in verse 20. The soul that sins, it shall die. Full stop. Bottom line. This is God's bottom line. There is no way we can pass the book. There is no way we can pass it to anybody else. It doesn't matter how wicked your parents are. It doesn't matter how wicked the religion is. It doesn't matter how wicked the state is or the government is. You are personally responsible before God. The solemn assurance and pronouncement regarding individual responsibility of sin in the rest of verse 20. You won't bear the iniquity of your father. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Is there a contradiction here? With such verse like Deuteronomy 5. The end of verse 9. Where it says visiting the iniquity of the fathers. Upon the children to the third and fourth generation. Of them that hate me. No, there's a simple difference. The simple difference is that in Deuteronomy 5, what God is talking about is a society as a whole. And that's still true. That's still true. There's a general principle of when a society turns from God, that does not just end with that generation. Yes, every generation has a responsibility for the ones to come. But isn't it wonderful that God's grace breaks through that general principle? And that any individual, just like in the letter to one of the churches in Revelation, if one person, even if the rest of the church, the door remains closed, if one person opens the door, I will come in through that door and I will eat, I will sup with him and he with me. See, it doesn't matter today. Don't look to your left or to your right. It doesn't matter. You might say, well, such and such doesn't live a very good example and and so on. No, the answer is, are you going to open the door? Are you going to say to Christ, I want your fellowship? As we come to the Lord's table this morning, are you going to say, don't just, you know, fall into the, into the, into the, the midst of the crowd. Are you going to have fellowship with Christ at the Lord's table? Because he looks at us all individually. And then in verses 21 to 29 we have repentance and apostasy. We have the repentance of the wicked and complete forgiveness in verses 21 to 22, which is wonderful. Listen, what a word we have here of the gospel. It, 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 I was going to say it doesn't matter how wicked, of course, it, ma- it always matters how wicked we've lived, but the point is this. Wickedness in the past does not prevent forgiveness and new life now. As you come before the Lord's table, as you have practiced sin, as you have committed sin even as a believer this week, We come in the reality of that promise. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We don't come to the Lord's table because we are righteous in ourselves, because we have obeyed. No, because we realize our sin. We see the desire of God in verse 23. Maybe you have not come to Christ 
because you don't really believe that God wants to forgive you. Maybe you don't want, maybe you're afraid to come to God because you think God will condemn you. But here God wears his heart on his sleeve, if I can reverently say that. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? As, a, as another verse says, why will he die? Why will he die? Look unto me, all the ends of the earth, as Isaiah could say, and be ye saved, for I am God. There's no one else. There is no other Savior. And this God, this Savior, wants to save. He loves to save. There's joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. Never doubt God's willingness to save your soul. But then we see the apostasy of the righteous in verse 24, at least those who appear to be righteous. How many of us know of professing believers who walked the path for many years and then turn away? One of the most dreadful funerals I was ever had the displeasure to attend was the funeral of one who was a youth leader, a very vibrant uh, individual in a, in a certain church. And about six years before he died, he completely turned away from the faith. Apostasy. A turning away. Which proved that salvation was never really there. You see, as someone said, it's not how we start, it's how we finish. And I remember someone saying that phrase when I was a young believer, the Christian life is not a hundred meter dash, it is a marathon. I used to think that was an excuse for not running fast or, or not doing a lot, but no, the point is we need to keep going. It's the ones who persevere to the end shall be saved. Persevere in faith, persevere in repentance. As Calvin says, repentance is not just the beginning of the Christian life. It is the Christian life. It is all of the Christian life. We, we sin daily and therefore we need to repent daily. We come this morning essentially to repent afresh of our sins and to believe afresh in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the answer to a lack of repentance, a lack of faith, is fresh repentance and fresh faith. Believe in Christ today as if it was your first day, as if it was the first moment, as if you had just been saved now. Don't buy into the lie of the devil that will get you to look back. Here God is exhorting the nation, the nation to look forward and look upward, as Hebrews says, looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Look to him. As we were saying in a private conversation with somebody yesterday, yes, look inwardly only enough time that you know that you're in your need for Christ. Don't stay looking inward. If you're just looking inward now, looking at your sin, looking at all the reasons why God should condemn you, you're robbing yourself of the, the joy, the liberty, the pleasure, the freedom of the children of God, cleansing us from all sin. The question comes, Whose judgment is thwarted, verses 25 to 29. The people are saying God's way is not equal. It's not balanced. This doesn't make sense. God's saying, no, no. You are the ones who are not thinking clearly. You're imbalanced in your mind. Paul says, as we quoted earlier on, let God be true and every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings 
and mightest overcome when thou art judged. You see, the only opinion that matters, the only judgment that matters is God's. You know, if God be for us, we're going to read that in the second service today. If God be for us, who can be against us? It does not matter what man says. If God proclaims us righteous in Jesus Christ, if God proclaims us forgiven for the sake of Jesus Christ, it matters not what the whole of creation says. God has pronounced forgiveness. God has pronounced that we are accepted in the beloved. And that's all that matters. So as Romans 3.19 says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. We need to experience the, the blessedness of just stopping. See, Saul only stopped momentarily. We need to learn the blessing of leaving the verdict with God. God declares us outside of Christ condemned. We say, Amen. God declares us in Christ forgiven, justified. And we say, Amen. God's verdict. God's judgment. You see, there's a, there's a thing in the justice system today where people will go to a higher and higher court to get the answer they want. Not satisfied with that answer, we'll go to another court, and so on. Just to get the judgment they want. For the believer, the supreme court of heaven has spoken. If God be for us, no one can be against us. He who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not along with him also freely give us all things? That's God's judgment. And then lastly, the pronouncement. The pronouncement in verses 30 to 32. Notice the right order. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel. You see, this is not a discussion. It's why Martin Lloyd-Jones didn't get into debates with unbelievers. He was invited to go on the BBC at one stage, I believe it was, a formal debate. Maybe it wasn't, maybe it wasn't the BBC for the debate. He was on that a couple of, for interviews. But he was invited to this big uh, public debate. And he said no. And the reason was the gospel is not a debate, it's not a discussion, it is a declaration. Here God is saying, you think you can make a judgment on me. No, O house of Israel, I will judge you. I will judge you. And the righteousness of the judgment is every one. It comes back to this principle. Every single one according to his ways. There will be perfect judgment. There will be righteousness of judgment. Saith the Lord God. Repentance required and its reason at the end of verse 30. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. The deceitfulness of sin is that it ruins us. When something is ruined, it is beyond use. Sin will make your life useless. It will make your soul useless. It will wreck you. It will ruin you. I remember seeing an, an awful scene of a, of a, a large juggernaut driving through a herd of animals. And the, the aftermath, it was, it was a thing I wish I'd never seen. Horrible picture. Horrible event. The carnage. The dreadful carnage of that moment. That's what sin does to us. It's like a juggernaut 
going through your soul and wreaking havoc and carnage in your soul. It will ruin you. It will destroy you. Because the devil does not just want you to sin. He wants to destroy you. He wants to ruin your soul, wreck your soul. Because your soul belongs to God. It's not really about you. It's about God's possession. You know, sometimes thieves will break into houses and they won't just steal things, but they do damage. They they pull things apart. They destroy things. That's the devil. And that's sin. And therefore, a radical and complete change is needed. Negatively, cast away all your transgressions. Like Paul says to the Ephesians, just get rid of them. You see, with sin, there's only one thing to do. Just get rid of it. Just put it in the bin. Put it in the rubbish. You don't sort of, you know, fill your black bin and then airs gets collected on the Monday and, you know, it, it gets carried off in the truck and brought to the tip or burnt, whatever it's done. You don't sort of run after the truck and say, oh, I want my rubbish back. No, you get rid of your rubbish. Get rid of your sin. Just um, put it away and forget about it. Positively make you a new heart. This does not contradict the fact that God can only create a new heart and a new spirit. This means that we want it. Someone said, and I forget who said this, and it's so true. You will get what you want, full stop. People say, you know, I'm having a crisis of faith. What an excuse for not wanting to believe. Your crisis is your unwillingness to trust. Your crisis is your unwillingness to repent. And the answer is, repent and believe. The answer is, change. Your answer is, repent and turn. Stop being disobedient. Stop making excuses for your sin. And then we have, lastly, the divine encouragement, verse 32. For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live. Turn and live. Picture comes to mind as we close of a car heading off about to head off the edge of the cliff and the simple answer is turn away don't go in the direction of death turn around and have the rest of your life is behind you (laughs) there's only one thing in front of you it's death turn around and have life and here God says turn and live don't Choose death. Choose life. Because God has pleasure in those that repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us sing from Psalm 140. Psalm 143, we're going to sing the second version. We're just going to sing one verse, verse 8. Psalm 143, verse 8, and we'll we'll repeat the verse twice. Because, uh, page 297, page 297, Because I trust in thee, O Lord, cause me to hear thy loving kindness free when morning doth appear. We need the morning, don't we?
Sometimes we can feel we're in the darkness, the night of not feeling the presence of God. We need the morning of his loving kindness. Cause me to know the way wherein my path should be. For why my soul on high I do lift up today. Listen, you don't need all the answers. You just need to be able to pray this prayer. And really want God to show you. And really want to follow him. And really want to love him. That's all you need. God takes care of the rest. The Lord takes care of it. It's not about knowledge. It's not about knowing everything. Not even about knowing all of the Bible and all of the theological arguments. It's not about that. It's simply desiring to turn, simply desiring to believe, simply desiring to want him more than anything else. And the Lord does the rest. Well, the Lord even does that, of course. Psalm 143 and verse 8. We'll stand to sing uh, the 8th verse. We'll repeat it twice. Because I trust in Thee, O Lord, cause me to hear Thy loving kindness free. When morning doth appear, cause me to know the Trust in thee, O Lord, cause me to hear thy loving kindness free when morning doth appear. Cause me to know the should be for why my soul on high I do lift up to thee let's pray father we we thank thee for the simplicity of the scriptures the message is clear the call is clear The judgment is clear. Father, all the difficulties lies in the heart of man. Father, we pray that the clarity of the gospel will penetrate into the darkness of our souls, our hearts, and shine the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And Lord, that thou mightest say, to the one who was dead in trespasses and sins, even this moment, live, live. And may we cry out to thee, Lord, save me. Lord, help me. Lord, grant to me thy salvation. For Jesus' sake, for his glory. Amen. Amen.